Has any of uh, any of you heard of psychoanalysis? Nobody. I'm shocked, but I guess I shouldn't be. Um, well, have you heard of Sigmund Freud? Yes. Okay. So Freud's the founder of psychoanalysis. Um, so I wanted to give you, given that you've not really heard, it sounds like this perspective. This should be interesting. I, I really value your thoughts, feedback, and interaction along the way, but I'm prepared to, to flap my gums the whole time. Um, but feel free to inter interrupt any time. So let me, um, let me introduce you to the thought that you really don't even know your own mind. You don't really know who you are. You might think you do, that you have conscious impressions of who you are. You might even think, well, this is who I am. I have a sense of self. This is what I value. This is what I think, feel, how I act and behave. But according to, um, to psychoanalytic thought, there's so much more to who you are that you're completely unaware of, that, that takes place outside of your conscious awareness. And that really, is the heart of who you are as a human being, as a human subject, and yet this might seem bizarre and odd, um, but by the end of this um, lecture, I hope to um, uh, open up the possibility that you might look at yourself and humanity and society in different ways. So, um, psychoanalysis was more or less uh, invented at the turn of um, 1900s, very um, much in the um, infancy of modern uh, science, and particularly the science of psychology. So, um, you know, there was really no formal discipline called psychology at that time. Uh, it wasn't until um, it became more of a, um, a segregated, segregated discipline of philosophy and that it would take on more of its own character. So it's a pretty psychology, how we understand the human nature, how we understand the mind, how we understand psyche, is really, um, you know, barely a hundred year old discipline. So the way we would go about trying to understand what motivates human behavior, action, thought, typically always revolved around this notion of consciousness. We're conscious, we make these decisions, we act this way. It was when Freud came along through his work with um, people who suffering from what used to be called neurosis, people who suffered from nerve problems, from anxiety, that a new way of, of thinking about the mind started to emerge and emerged from the way he worked with certain patients. So for instance, he was um, uh, a Viennese, uh, meaning from Vienna, Austria, um, physician. He was actually a neurologist originally. And then he started to see uh, people for nervous conditions. We didn't even have that in those days. Uh, you know, what, what you call now psychology, you, you go see a psychologist, a therapist to talk about things that bother you. That was all new in those days. Um, not to mention that they didn't have medication to give somebody a pill when they're talking about suffering from something. Here, take a pill, take, you know, take it away, is what they do today, which I think is a bunch of bullshit. But nevertheless, that's the way people have been inculcated to think. Um, I have a certain, I don't like the way I'm thinking, feeling, I don't like my life, uh, something must be wrong with me, therefore I have a disorder. I go to the doctor and they diagnose me with depression or anxiety, and here's a pill, and take it and you'll feel better. Well, that's not how psychoanalysis works. Psychoanalysis works in the sense that you have some kind of internal conflict, but you're not aware of it. How does it manifest itself? It manifests itself as symptoms. So I feel anxious, I feel depressed, I, um, I'm phobic about something, I avoid discomfort, um, I'm nervous. 
The, the question is not that you have a disorder. The question is, what is causing it? And hence, this is what, we, when you start asking yourself these questions, which are really quite philosophical, um, you start to discover things that you might not have thought existed. So, for instance, one of um, Freud's earliest cases um, that he elaborated in his first book called Studies on Hysteria. Uh, hysteria, uh, we don't call it that today. We would call it more of an anxiety disorder, conversion disorder. But at the time, uh, he was seeing patients that um, had, had certain types of physical symptoms, like they had pain in their body. They couldn't walk. They um, would be um, not able to have a certain motility. They would have problems with their stomachs. They would have problems with um, not being able to speak properly. But there's no underlying organic cause. So how is it that the doctors say, nothing's wrong with your vocal cords, nothing's wrong with your legs, yet you're not able to walk. And so through, through his uh, process of, um, um, of, of talking, asking questions of the patient, getting to understand how they experience these things, there are certain types of information that emerges. So for instance, one of the um, early patients her name was um, Elizabeth Von R, and she presented with a myriad of different kinds of, uh, of problems. Here's a young woman in her early 20s where she's almost bedridden. She can't walk. There's nothing wrong with her. She feels pain in her legs when she gets out of bed. Uh, she started developing other types of symptoms, and many patients do as well. Sometimes people have temporary blindness. Sometimes um, uh, they, they go deaf. And, but yet, there's nothing wrong with their eyes. There's nothing wrong with their hearing apparatus. So, um, trying, to, uh, trying to uncover what might be an underlying cause uh, was part of the process of um, conducting a psychoanalytic treatment. So psychoanalysis basically is an analysis, an understanding of the psyche, of the mind, let's say. Um, in one particular case, um, a young woman developed um, an inability to speak and, a, and a, a soreness in her throat. And there's no reason why. It turns out, after a course of treatment, there's a certain secret that she had been harboring unconsciously. Something that's inside you, but you don't know it's there because it's being kept from conscious awareness. And this particular secret was that she um, was in love with her sister's husband. And she could not allow herself to acknowledge this. Now, keep in mind, at the turn of the century um, in Victorian Europe, people didn't talk about sex, traumas, things openly like they do now. To now, it's nothing to discuss. However, it was very difficult for people, in the, and particularly this, this woman, because it was considered to be improper. One does not fall in love with one's sister's husband. Uh, one doesn't have sexual desire for him. It would be more than inappropriate. It would be something that people would see as sinful, uh, something that would be um, seen as obscene. She had a particular fantasy that had been dissociated. And the fantasy is that she wanted to perform fellatio on her sister's husband. What happens? It was so unacceptable for her that unconsciously it needs to be repressed. 
It needs to be dissociated. It needs to be denied. And yet, what emerges? What emerges is the symptom, not being able to speak, not, not being able to talk, and yet feeling, where is the symptom? In the very location of where she wanted to have the wish fulfilled. And hence, how do you understand the unconscious mind? There is at once a, pro a prohibition, a denial, a negation, a repression of the wish. But the wish still wants to be fulfilled. And so it's fulfilled through a circuitous route where the symptomatology emerges. At once, a punishment, a prohibition against a sexual desire that she should like to have fulfilled but cannot allow herself. And when she became aware of the conflict in her mind over time and working through this contradiction, the symptoms went away. She was able to speak again and talk normally and deal with what was unconsciously being barred. So this opened up a very interesting notion that much of what we think, feel, experience, desire, we are not aware of. Um, and hence, this is where this notion that there must be an unconscious part of the mind that's operative at all times and that um, motivates our behavior unbeknownst to our conscious self. So, over many, many years, um, psychoanalysis started to develop as a discipline. And it started to expand upon these earlier findings. And so I'm, I want to give you kind of a, a Cliff Notes um, version of, of trying to understand the complexity of um, human nature and of uh, the psyche. <coughs> On one hand, Freud talked about <clears throat> this realm of the unconscious, this domain that we don't have direct access to, but we can only know it through how it appears. And so symptoms are one way it appears. But this domain is different than consciousness. And it's also different from another form of consciousness, which we call morality, or we call uh, having an ethical sensibility, um, having a sense of conscience. Now that's a developmental achievement, meaning that we're not born moral. We become moral over time through development, through acculturation, uh, through education, through modeling, uh, through our direct experiences with our family and community and the like. But first and foremost, we are um, instinctual beings. So we, are, we have certain types of drives in us, meaning this is part of our embodiment. And these things take place mostly unconsciously, uh, but not always. At, uh, we, we, talk, we would refer to this as the domain of um, what, uh, what he called the, the it, this impersonal pronoun, it. Uh, it's been translated in English as the id. Basically, it's, that's Latin for it. So here's this realm of the, of the psyche, the mind, that's dissociated from who we kind of see ourselves from. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that we can consciously alter that? If we have consciously alter that, that would be possible? Yes, we can modify them. And this is the most important thing that you bring up. Once we become aware of it, have insight to it, we can modify certain aspects of who we are. But until we're aware of it, they tend to operate unconsciously in certain forms, sometimes uninhibited forms, and other times, uh, you know, deliberate. Uh, but um, the trick is, how do we get there? 
So uh, let's continue with positing that what is this domain of the unconscious? Well, it's, our, it's part of our animal nature. And this could be very much tied to our evolutionary past. Um, the unconscious has these drives. The main two are sex, sex and aggression, sexual desire. And this desire or for destruction. Freud referred to it uh, as the death drive, but it is the form of our innate aggressions that we have, and, uh, and every human being has them. You had your hand up? Uh, yeah, but I was just going to um, ask about Sigmund Freud's belief in the fact that we all have sexual desire, having relations with our parents, and I was just wondering why would Good, good point. So, um, you're a little ahead of me, which yeah. is good. Um, so the notion is, um, if we all have sexual desire, we all have innate aggressions, how is it expressed? Well, Freud, through his analysis of patients and his own self-analysis, came to the conclusion that young children express their, uh, what he referred to as uh, libido, which in German is really lust or sexual lust. They, they experience it in different ways. They experience it in modified ways in the body. So through oral gratification, through various erogenous zones of their body, they get pleasure from but not as a sexual desire and sexual pleasure as adults, um, or you know, when a person, a, an adolescent, goes through puberty and things like this. It's the channeling of psychic energies and the seeking of pleasure, the seeking of satisfaction in objects. So um, this naturally led through um, you know, through his treatment of, of patients, to uh, have a certain hypothesis, what we call the Oedipus complex, that children develop certain desires for their parents. And in a very kind of um, um, stereotyped way, we would say a little boy develops a crush on his mommy. And he wants to take mommy, just like daddy does, for his own possession. He Again, the little boy doesn't have, you know, the, the sexual uh, desire or apparatus as an adult, but this is the forms of affection, the forms of bonds, the forms of how love manifests itself. And he then sees his dad as a rival on some level. He would like to be solely mommy's possession and have her like father does. But then this leads to rivalry. This leads to fear of retaliation from powerful father, who's so much bigger and scarier, and who is the authority in the home. So this naturally creates tensions in, in the psyche, in the mind. One is, how do I secure avenues of attachment and pleasure with my mother and shelter myself from my, my father's um, um, you know, wrath or anger or jealousy or envy? How do I deal with my own resentments for my father's presence? And we then try to find some kind of compromise. Yeah? So if you accept that this innate nature that we have with our parents is natural in the sense within ancestral relationships, we presumably is like a natural part of like the human experience. Uh, this is a good question, and it's also quite debatable. But on, on, the, on the surface of things, if we start, first start with the notion that children form attachments to their parents, and naturally that might um, you know, lead to other fantasies, and the fantasies might be incestuous in nature, but they may, not, they may be as... Um, having sexual relations with parents, 
Often these are very unconscious and repressed and we're not usually aware of them, but they might come out in certain ways uh, once one starts to analyze their early childhood experiences. Um, do we want to then make the leap, the jump to, oh yeah, everybody wants to have sex with their mom and kill their dad. <laughs> so, uh, well, maybe some do. And, and, you know, people who, of course, have come to see me in therapy, uh, in, in psychoanalytic treatment, can often become in touch with these types of feelings that they didn't think they had, but in retrospect, trying to reconstruct, they, they would say, yes, I remember feeling very jealous of my, uh, of my father's, you know, getting to have my mother, and I didn't. And through that, uh, we don't necessarily have to say uh, a child is going to have full-blown desires and needs to have incest with a parent. But believe me, look at human nature, and you will see this happens everywhere and in every culture. And it might be an aberrant form, meaning that you know people are stimulated by their parents, by their siblings. Uh, they get uh, sexually aroused, and this may lead to certain sexual activity within the home, within the extended family, with other cousins, uh, who knows. Um, nevertheless, getting back to the notion that this is still, sexuality is innate, it's, um, you know, just instinctual, it's a given, it's part of who we are, and yet our choices are different. So object choices come into play. Freud would say ultimately um, that you know, a desire has no bounds. It is what it is. Only the objects change. That one can desire um, a same sex, an opposite sex, an object. The whole notion of homosexuality, bisexuality, uh, the transgendered movement would all be explained from a psychoanalytic perspective. It's just in different forms, in different ways. We need to understand this, the individual psyche of that person and what, you know, what their desires are, what the conflicts are that leads them into picking certain object choices. Now, look at yourselves. Um, Think about people you know. Uh, from my clinical experience, what's interesting is that people realize that they end up being in relationships with people who in many ways mirror their, their, at least one of their parents. So why is it that you're in an abusive marriage, that you allow your husband to devalue you verbally and emotionally and you, you accept it in a masochistic fashion. Uh, you stay with him. When, what are you getting out of it? Well, you're getting some masochistic satisfaction, meaning that you feel you need to be hurt. You need to be put down. You need to be devalued by the other that's supposed to love you. And then, is it a coincidence that you grew up in a family with a, an abusive alcoholic father who um, devalued his family, his mother, or your, the, the, the patient's mother, um, that he was aloof, unavailable, negative. And here there's an unconscious identification with the father. And you end up with someone very much like him. Is this a coincidence? You're not consciously saying, I'm going to go out and pick an asshole. <laughs> no. You, you, you find yourself attracted to these types of people because they're familiar. Um, it could be that you also identify, let's say a man identifies with um, his mother in certain ways and he picks a woman very much similar to her. Now, that is a compliment, whether you know it or not. Um, one has a positive attachment to his mother 
One wants to take a love object in real life. Of course, it's not his mother. It's only on the condition that it's not his mother that it's permissible. And yet there seems to be a, a simpatico with the qualities that she has and the partner this person ends up with. And hence, um, these are more than coincidences. These show us in many ways how the unconscious is operative. Yeah. Um, Well, um, unlike some fad forms of therapy where they say, all you have to do is think happy thoughts and you'll be happy. Um, this form of therapy is about insight. It's about coming, allowing you to become more aware of these internal conflicts that you have. And hence, in many, in many ways, it is a philosophical project of wanting to bring to consciousness what's unconscious, just like, um, you know, just like the love of wisdom, is to understand um, you know, what, what is um, motivating us, what's most important in life, what we want to achieve. The idea here is that when we have knowledge, of something, we ha have more of a capacity to now change the way we view things and make different choices. So, the person who, let's say, is in an abusive relationship and st is staying, doesn't fully understand what's motivating them to, s to remain in, by all objective standards, a bad relationship. When she or he comes to understand that, that what's really fueling me to be here is unhealthy and pathological. I now have insight in, in, into why I would even pick someone like this to begin with. Let's say a fantasy in the back of one's head is that I really don't feel I deserve to be loved because I never really felt that growing up from my parents. I don't know what that's like, so I'll just accept or take anyone because I'd rather be with somebody than be alone. But you pick out, you, you've picked, deliberately pick someone who actually makes your life more miserable, makes you more unhappy. And they realize this was a bad choice. I have other options. I, I'm, I'm going to get out of this. And hence, one um, becomes more aware of their unconscious conflicts that keep them there to begin with. Yeah. Okay. Good. These are good questions because you're getting um, you're you're getting at the notion of causation. Mm -hmm. Now we unfortunately live in a very simple world. It's either nature or nurture. It's either my genes made me do it uh, versus my environment conditioned me. When in reality, that's not the way the psyche works. That's not the way human nature is. And these are very complex issues when you're talking about causality. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that everything is overdetermined. There's multiple causal factors that are at play into why a person would behave a certain way, why they'd be attracted to certain people, why they would take these love objects over others. And one can say, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm in my environment, I'm conditioned because I, you know, I'm around people who talk like me, look like me, and this makes sense. Well, 
what happens if that is true, that the pool of objects are here in your environment, in your culture, and yet, unconsciously, we're identifying with certain kinds of people, certain kinds of objects that we are attracted to or we feel a repellent toward, we feel um, negativity toward. So, still the notion of identification is so important because partly it's conscious. I say, I like these people, I like these values. I like this culture, I don't like this one. Um, so, that's conscious, but there's also other aspects of who you are that are operative. And this is why the psyche is internally divided. That there are different splits and different levels uh, and different divisions of mind that have their own kind of autonomous functioning. Until they're brought in together, until they're brought into a synthetic kind of conversation or a dialogue. And that's where synthetic integrative functions in the psyche, in the mind, in the, in the ego takes place. So this is why Freud wanted to start with more primitive aspects of who we are and how we develop. We develop through our relations to our parents, our community, through socialization practices, and hence we develop an ego uh, or a sense of self. The ego here is the I. You, you say to yourself, I, like the pronoun, it's, or me. You have a conscious sense of who you are. At least I'm assuming you do. Not everyone does. Um, people can be very confused about who they are. They have no idea who they are, what they stand for. And that's also developmentally appropriate, particularly when we're young. So the, the ego, the sense of self, develops over time based upon socialization, based upon our attachments to our parents, based upon the values uh, that they inculcate in us and we, we, we identify with and take into our own. And then more of a developmental achievement is what Freud called uh, the superego. Um, the German is the uber ich, the the, the above eye, the over eye, the eye that's supposed to be ideal over our sense of normal conscious self. That's the domain of ethics. That's the domain of conscience. That's the domain of the values that we all, maybe not all, but we identify with, internalize, and uh, value and want to become like. So the superego is that realm of uh, morality, of ethics, it's also a very critical agency. It is the domain of ideals, of perfections, and of right and wrong. It is the law. It is the eternalization of what we've been taught. We do this and we don't do that. So when that faculty develops, we now have three competing masters that the poor ego has to deal with. The, the, the poor ego, the sense of yourself, you go, geez, what do I have to do now? Well, you have to, you have to mediate three things in the psyche. One is the reality of the external world. That's what the ego does. It's everything. It's our cognitive functions. It's our executive functions. It has everything to do with perception, with thought, with reason, with uh, intention, emotionality, all these things that you would lump into who you kind of define who you are. But external reality, whether you like it or not, imprints itself on you and you have to react to it. And this is the job of the ego. Um, the ego also has to serve other masters. It has to, it has to deal with this superego and the superego is that critical faculty says this is right and this is wrong and you have to behave this way and not that way and if you don't you're a bad person and if or if you don't you're going to go to jail you better curb your thoughts your desires your actions and conform to certain social value practices now that can be really overdeveloped 
in the sense that that's the location of shame and of guilt. When you've done something wrong, do we, do we address it? Do we acknowledge it? Do we accept responsibility? Do we then make reparation for our transgressions? Uh, do we try to make up for it by doing something good to counterbalance our transgression? Or do we live in denial? No, not my problem. Do we become like President Trump? Nothing but a negation of any responsibility that a moral human being would have. Um, well, that kind of psychopathic tendency, and that's exactly what it is, that I don't care about other people, I have no empathy for others, people are objects to be used and disposed of once I'm done with them, and that's a very narcissistic stance. Um, so, if I'm going to relate to other people as objects for me to use and manipulate and dispose of once I've gotten my way with them, when certain satisfactions, pleasures, enjoyments have been, um, you know, seduced and, and exploited, then we would say that that type of person does not have a developed superego. They don't have a, a developed sense of, of ethics, of morality, of right and wrong. Um, we would also say that people just aren't born psychopathic. They become that way. And I'm sure if we took a long look at something, we would see why people become like that. Often, they're treated like objects themselves. They are not given warmth, love, affection, validation, recognition, or empathy for who they were as a kid. And they realize that if this is the way the world works, I'm going to, I'm going to treat others just like that. This is the type of person who doesn't know their own mind. They just act based upon uninhibited, unrestrained instinct. Raw, primitive, unconscious mentation. Now, the other realm that poor ego has to deal with is it has to secure that has to secure boundaries for satisfaction for its unconscious desires. So, um, there might be primitive kinds of impulses that we have, such as, and don't, you can keep this to yourself, but please be honest with yourself. Haven't you had fantasies of wanting to hurt somebody? <laughs> Have a, all the time. Haven't you wanted to have fantasies that, that you wish that person was dead? That I merely wish that they would vanish. When you encounter someone you don't like, or the way they treat you in a negative way, bye-bye. But then that's only a fantasy. That's only a thought. But at least you're aware of certain, what we would say, Primitive, let's use more other words such as uncultivated, let's say um, more archaic forms of expression. So it's easier to become in contact with notions of um, when we're angry, when we're upset, when we ne have a negative emotion that we attach to an object. But it's another thing to say, um, that, uh, yeah, I have, I do, um, I do wish somebody was dead. And now you have a superego that says, you know, that's not a very good thing to think. That's not a nice person. A, a nice person wouldn't wish somebody dead. And hence, you've got a conflict in your psyche. This part would like to see this happen. Another part would say, not only should you not think that and do that, but you should be punished for thinking that. You're not a good person. And hence, you have this sense of guilt or, or a sense of shame that you might have to sit with because you feel inadequate or inferior or deficit. But this is the way the psyche works. You have got to modify, to entertain, to dialogue with securing boundaries for multiple wishes to be fulfilled and other wishes to be uh, squelched. And the ego is kind of like finding ways of placating all these different forces. 
And what does that do? It produces anxiety. Now, anxiety is not something that is um, pathological. It just is what it is. This is what the human being has to go through. If you, if you start to think of anxiety um, as a disorder, what, such as what the medical profession will have you think today, um, then you're missing the boat. Anxiety is a signal to the ego that you have to do something. You're in a, it's kind of in a dangerous situation here. So you have different forms of anxiety, uh, anxiety that we would call from the external world, reality. Reality says you have to do certain things and oh, now I'm, I'm anxious about it. How do I go about achieving it? Um, well, you're all here to get an education. If you don't come here and get an education, you're going to go and work at um, Fat Moe's across the street. And, sla and you can, you can you know, slap burgers. And you'll be making minimum wage. You're saying, I don't want to make minimum wage. I, I want a better life. So I, I'm going to go get educated, um, thinking that this is a, an avenue. But it produces anxiety, like this guy who's shaking his leg over here. Uh, so the notion is, oh, you know, and now I have to learn something, I have to read, and I have to memorize, and I have to think on my own because not, no one's going to spoon feed it to me. And you go, shit, this, this is tough. That's called moral anxiety, or that's called real, real, realistic anxiety. Um, you have neurotic anxiety. And this is the person who becomes paralyzed by society, the demands of others, the external world's too much, I can't cope, I can't handle it. And they haven't found appropriate ways to mitigate or to um, achieve, and this is the thing, it's through labor that you necessarily have to work hard in order to get where you, where you want to be. And by working hard, whether it be in class, doing your homework, reading, thinking, this is really the most important thing, learning how to think critically in the world is in of itself the best education one could ever have um, because it prepares you for the world, even if you don't get the job you want. Other forms of anxiety, moral anxiety. How do I be a, you know, a decent person? Or how do I just be you know, somebody who doesn't have to be perfect, but I have to live up to certain ideals? I mean, people die for their ideals. I mean, you've got, a, let's take extreme forms of religious fanaticism. Who's going to strap on a bomb uh, to a little girl uh, from Boko Haram, who took from, um, uh, you know, uh, the school, school children and strap a bomb on her, send her through a, a crowded uh, marketplace, and it detonates. Um, it's only on the condition that, that God, Allah, wants that. Well, that's, act, that's done in the service of an ideal. Whereas others are going to say, who's psycho over there? Psycho, danger, uh, crazy. Uh, yet, this is what motivates people to act. Their ethics motivates them to act, even as warped and disturbed as it is. Um, think now, let's stay on the religion thing. You have the superimposed superego that's imposed on society, religion, with all its practices, with all its belief systems, with its rituals, um, with its way of being that is being done under the rubric of God's will. Who's the biggest superego? It's God. The superego in the sky that's judging you that has a certain valuation practice that you must live up to. And if you do not, not only you are, you're not a bad, you're a bad person, you're not only um, are you 
um, not going to be rewarded in this life, but you're going to suffer in the next. Now, we think of how warped that is. But yet, six billion people believe it on some level out of our world population. Um, so when you start thinking critically about human nature, the psyche, um, the complexity of it, and we set aside this simple notion that my genes made me do it or my environment you know, made me think this way, and you take responsibility for who you are as an agent, let alone a moral agent, you realize that you, you have a lot more um, power here to the way you view the world, yourself, others, and your relationship to the world. And what we, he what we have is a, a very sophisticated form of um, philosophy. We would have what the, what the, pl the platonic soul so the platonic soul or the psyche, that's what the Greeks called the soul, um, was the interaction uh, of, of passion or desire or eros, that of nous, which is mind or reason, and that of our moral conscience or our mores. That's what the Greeks were about. It was about virtue, about living a good life, um, and yet, what psychoanalysis introduces to this is that this is largely unconsciously motivated. You have a sense of self, an ego, and a superego that's unconsciously organized. And so, uh, it's, not just, it's just not a conscious phenomenon. Um, why do people have punishment fantasies? Why do people... Why are people depressed? Why do they feel a sense of melancholia? Um, or they don't feel lovable. Uh, they don't feel that people really value them and they don't value themselves. They may even have a, a very delusional um, view of who they are, that they're bad people that need to be punished. But often our punishment fantasies is because we've, we've done something we know is wrong. And we feel bad about it. And we are punishing ourselves for it. When punishments um, are made up, when we make reparation for things, when we say, I'm sorry, um, when we acknowledge our fallibility, it often leads to some relief inside. Because that's basically all we can do. And we, and we can learn from that. that um, simple rule, I believe it came from Jesus. How do you want to be treated? I'll treat people like I want to be treated. But if I treat people like I, I don't want to be treated that way, but I'll, I'll treat people anyway because I know I can get away with it. The unconscious is going to come back to haunt you in your dreams, in your symptoms, in unhappiness. You're hurting yourself. Now, this is to show how complex this is. Because it, it, it really opens up the issue of the problem of evil. If we, by definition, um, have these base desires, instincts, urges, uh, fantasies that we, of, let's say, of violence, of aggression, of negativity that we direct toward other people, other objects, not to mention sexual desire toward other objects. Well, we just don't let that play out, do we? Except if you're Donald Trump. Um, he's, he's a great example. So most of us, most men, would not grope women in the crouch. So mo most men would not do that because they would, you would have the ego say, if you do that, you're going to jail. And that's called reality principle. The reality principle is out there for a reason. And it's never to be underestimated. My fantasy is I'd like to grab a woman in the crotch. 
You have a fantasy about that. But I just don't do it. But if you're Donald Trump, you not only do it, you brag about it. And hence, what's even more hilarious is that he gets away with it. How is it possible that nothing could be done? Whereas I would go to jail, others don't. Well, sure, but there's other things. Um, you have a society, at least a majority, maybe a minority, let's say half, let's say 40% of his base that still approves of him. So that's four out of 10 say that's okay. Um, now that's crazy, isn't it? Obviously not very good for, for, for women in that situation. But most of us say, we, we, not only uh, am I not going to do that, um, there's a part that says that's not what a good person should do. It's unethical. So not only I'm not going to do it because the law says not to, but it's not a good thing to do. It's just a bad, it's bad. It's evil. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't kill people now, would we? One part of us says, yeah, yeah, just push a button. Then you go, oh my God, I have to deal with the horrific consequences of my actions. Yeah. Um, would it make any Okay, All right, so on one hand, yes, particularly if you're, you know, a, um, um, you're an engineer interested in military science, and we have to think about the best way to uh, wipe out the enemy. We're going to about be thinking, you know, rationally about that, and we're going to be thinking rationally about the conditions of which uh, certain laws and, and morality should be applied. So that's a little bit different than you as a human being, um, supposing that you uh, are not a psychopath, uh, would start questioning um, certain, um, certain mores. And one is, yes, just because the law says we shouldn't do it, but in this, this is the context. The context here is not about whether or not I should wear my seatbelt and should get a ticket. It's about whether or not I should kill a human being and is it okay if I do? And under what conditions is it okay and, other, and what conditions isn't? But we're getting into kind of an, you know, certainly a more um, profound intellectual, intellectualization at this, at this stage. If we're talking about you on, on, on the level of needing to be put into a position of whether or not it's okay to kill somebody and whether or not um, under what conditions, then we usually have different conditions for that, such as, okay, I can see myself in self-defense if I have to, but again, it's in the context of a, a perpetrator. How about you perpetrating against others? Well. Um, Wouldn't in that context, you're perpetrating, so you'd be already willing to kill them anyway. You're the perpetrator, so it wouldn't matter. Well, I'm going to break into your house, and you're, you, let's see, you got a gun. Well, I'm already willing to break into your house, so then therefore I'd be willing to kill you as well, right? Yeah, and that's what we call bad people. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I have a 12 gauge Mossberg in my bedroom. <laughs> Um, and I'm from Canada. <laughs> the, thing, the thing here is, yes, there are bad people out there um, that freely choose to do bad things, which um, I'm not wanting to say is because we are all primitive human beings and that we can just act on any desire. I'm saying it's because... Um, these people have uh, not developed a sense of conscience and superego um, and 
a sense of right and wrong that would put in certain inhibitions against that action. Um, we could probably all, though, and this is an important point, um, we could probably all imagine ourselves in certain situations where we would hurt others, and deliberately so, intentionally so. However, doesn't that create a sense of discomfort? sense of anxiety for us. It's like, okay, yeah, condition of self-defense, I'd have to do it, versus others wouldn't. Um, but again, when it comes to understanding the psyche, on one level, all these things are universal, meaning that they apply to everybody collectively, regardless of, of gender, age, race, culture, geographic location. And on the other hand, it really is about our own individuality, about developing this sense of self, a sense of individuation based upon what we value, what we don't value, what we want to become, what we want to um, you know, achieve in some existential fashion. Um, and those, those forces are complex, they're very dynamic. And it leads to no simple solution. But what it does reveal is the notion that everyone by nature is evil. It's just a matter of degree. That's, that's the evil within. And you have to, you have to acknowledge that you know, you're not a perfect saint. And there's no such thing anyway. The notion of perfection, of, I, of ideality, is it, is it of itself a fantasy? But that's the fantasy. Those are the illusions that people live their life for in order to become this ideal. And so it could be as mundane as I'm only going to be happy if I, if I work really hard, if I'm perfect, um, if I do these things, I'm going to have these uh, rewards. And then you get there and you say, this is vacuous. This doesn't really make me happy. Um, let's take a banal example. The desire. Does not, desire is something that's never permanent. You know, let's say, I, I, I'm going to get a new car. And the new car I have on my, my wish list is that's what, if I have that car, that's going to make me happy. That's going to be fun. I achieve it, I buy it, and all of a sudden, you know what, the thrill's kind of worn off, hasn't it? Big deal. Um, I'm going to look for a new object of pleasure, a new object of satisfaction now, something else that's going to promise me to fulfill this lack, this internal void. And that's what desire is. It's, it's our being in relation to lack, to absence. That's why desire can never be fulfilled. Not, it's, it can only be temporarily sated. That's, that's the fate of, of the human psyche, is that we have to live with lack, and yet we have to develop a sense of agency and a world a view of what we want to bring about for ourselves so we can secure our enjoyments and so we can also do something that's of value. It's not enough just to have material objects um, to consume. It's that you want to become, I think most people do, they want to become something more than just a consumption machine. And so part of that is clearly based upon um, a certain internalized ethos or ethics or values or ideals that matter to you. Whether or not they matter to others, you're always going to be in conflict with other people's desires, no matter what. And in every aspect of our own society, we're constantly confronted with others' desires and others' values that negate mine. And hence, it's not um, a surprise that we would have problems with prejudice, 
that we had had problems with racism, particularly in this country, um, because the other stands for the evil other, the person that opposes me. And it's often a fantasy. Like, I'm projecting all my fantasies into that other when you don't even know who the other is. And, and yet, this seems to be what the human animal likes to do. Everybody needs a whipping boy. Somebody needs some object of displacement. I have to take my own aggressions, frustrations, and someone else should pay. Just like um, when you don't want to take any accountability or responsibility for your own actions, you're always going to be looking for someone else to blame. So how do we uh, get out of this? How do we mediate this? Um, this is what makes the human animal very complex. No simple solutions here, but the, the more you become aware of your internal contradictions, your internal desires that are at odds with one another, at least you start to have insight into them. And, you know, in many ways, um, we have to maintain a tension of opposites in our mind. And sometimes the opposition needs to have a dialogue with one another. We need to bring it into a conversation, so to speak. And through that, like this part of me wants this, this part of me says this, this part of me says no, this part of me actually not only doesn't want that, but, but condemns that, how do I find a compromise? How do I find um, maybe a middle path? How do I find a way of transcending the tensions? And that brings it into a new realm, a new, a new sphere of um, synthesis, so to speak, or integration. And the integration is on a conscious level, but really it's on a self-conscious level you become more self-consciously aware of you as a human being with all your flaws and all your possibilities. Just like with our parents. We don't see our parents as adults um, this, in the way as a child. We don't, our parents, you know, on one hand we might idealize our parents as children. And then we realize as adults that they're not perfect. And we have to see all their flaws and all their faults and times they've let you down when you needed them. But you bring them into an integrated picture that no one's perfect, they've got the good and the bad, but this is how you still, you still have a mental representation of who they are to you, what they mean, and how you value them. And Often, we can never escape the, um, the toll as well as the um, gift that our parents have given to us. On one hand, we're going to have a certain degree of suffering. Uh, on the other hand, we're going to be given things that we value and cherish because they have been uh, internalized in us based upon what we identify with. They're good, they're good soul. They're a beautiful soul that we take into ourselves. But this takes us all the way back to the ancients. The ancients viewed um, the human being as um, living in pathos. Pathology is what we call it a day. But for the Greeks, pathos was uh, suffering that we we necessarily have to suffer on some level uh, because to be human is to suffer. It's to find ways of alleviating it though. So hence, for, for psychoanalytic uh, you know, mentation or thought, you know, this is part of the normal anxieties that we have to negotiate. Um, we look to models and ideals to try to emulate and live up to and become because we we give them the highest um, form of ideation or I ideality. But we can never live up to them. We, we can never be the ideal. 
yet we, we value that. And so hence, the striving for it is a value in and of itself. It's not necessarily, you know, the destination, but the method or journey that one has to go through in their own life. And that's what we, you know, call being, being a human. Uh, I think I blabbed enough. Um, Let me ask you this. So, you mentioned the notion of conscience, which um, I have to say to my personal life is always troubling. And then you have reason. How do you resolve a conflict in which your conscience tells you one thing? So it says, that's a bad thing to do, you shouldn't do it. And then the reason says, why not? What's so bad about it? Bad is a feeling that got inculcated into you by your family, by your society. So now your conscience is saying, oh wow, you are such a bad person because you want to instantiate. Whereas your reason is saying, society is screwed up. This, the, the, the society kind of fed this conscience, but if you, you, if you could talk to society and say, give me a good argument why this is bad, you hear silence. How do you resolve that? Well, I'm not sure it's resolvable. Um, can it be reformulated, reintegrated into, you know, your psyche? So. Uh, Again, um, from a psychological point of view, um, all of the things that trouble us are based upon internal psychic conflict. They're not based upon, you know, I was born this way, or my parents told me this. But as a small child, we're very vulnerable to these powerful messages, prohibitions, oughts, ideals that we should be told that we have to emulate and live up to. And a small child doesn't have the capacity for rational thought that we do now. So it's as if, um, if we're told by a powerful authority early in life when we don't have a developed sense of self, we don't, like a child at, uh, let's say, um, up to four years old doesn't even have the capacity for um, you know hypothetical deductive reasoning it's uh, whatever's told to you is an emotional truism that's taken in it's not filtered through a rational lens it's accepted as unadulterated truth and you must do this it's as if it's the law and yet it leaves a psychological or emotional residue let's say guilt, that if you, you know, if you don't do this, you're going to, if you don't go to church, you don't do your prayers or whatever. You, 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 you can, can come up with any of your own examples based upon your own life, on your own internal conflicts. The issue is that you identify with, you took them in, it's left a sediment unconsciously. And in this, say we, in this sense, we could say that it's a determinant factor and why you have an internal complex. But when you get older, you say, you know, that's a bunch of hogwash. You know, I, I have the capacity to think critically now, and what I was told then doesn't make any sense. Now, the question, though, is that it's left its residue. And so there'd be a portion of us that really can't let go of that because it had such an emotional significance. And in many ways, it, it kind of can show how our, our mind can be transported back to our past, to our childhood, where the, the, you know, the impression or the impact of that has a, a life of its own. Um, we just have to have a dialogue with that. Um, to what degree having that dialogue will lead to a inner transformation that, that will lead to a modification of those original thoughts, 
is another is another question. But um, the point is that because there's multiple aspects of self, or what we might call self states, um, they all um, are in us, and they are seeking their own form of expression. So when you become aware of the contradictions or the negative emotions, you'll have to sit through it. And by sitting through it, by engaging it, by reflecting upon it through our self-conscious deliberations or meditations, um, it can lead to moments of shifts or transformations. And then are we able to then reintegrate it into our personalities? That's, I guess, going to be up to the individual's own process of becoming. So even though it's not a satisfactory answer, that was my attempt. All right. Uh, I guess time flew. Well, this is how lectures should look like. You're going to get it from me, just so now by now. Um, I think that this was quite enlightening, both for you and for me. Uh, he did an excellent job. Um, one thing that I want you to do is to sign this before you part, and I will see you after the break. So he, Thank he, you very much. He treats you like, like kindergarten children. You have to sign a sheet, huh? That's right. <laughs>